Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Titus. Titus meaning protected. Um, I, I want you to always remember what we gained from chapter 1, kind of the, the uh, formula and the, the thought of this great book is in verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure. In other words, you strive to do that. It picks your life up. And that's what serving God is all about. And then the main point we derive from chapter 2. It's something that is um, a Christian that you never want to let anyone take away from you as long as you call yourself a Christian. And that is the 14th verse of chapter 2. And it read, Who gave himself, that's to say our Lord, for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That means all sin. Now, never, uh, anytime a church tries to limit what Christ forgives and what he can't forgive, you want to be very careful. Christ is able to forgive all iniquity. That's all sin. Naturally, in the end times, there is the unpardonable sin. You don't have to worry about that now. It doesn't happen until the false Messiah sets foot on earth at the sixth trump. So those, those two points so far is to those that are pure, all things are pure. They always look for the better side of things. They always try to improve things. To an unbeliever, it's just the opposite. They will take that that is bad. They will pick the bad most often. Why? They don't have the blessings of God in their life or in their family. And then uh, if you fail to understand all iniquity and you attend some group that says, well, if you're a divorcee, you go to the back of the church. Don't teach a Sunday school class. You can't do this. That makes a liar out of God's word. If somebody repents, you're not to judge. God is. Well, what does God say? He says, Christ forgives and is able to redeem you from all iniquity, all sin. So those two points that we've gathered from chapter 1 and chapter 2, let's see what we can gather from chapter 3 as we complete the book of Titus. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. That's every work that is worthwhile. You want to always pick a profession in your life that you enjoy and do it better than anyone else as best you can. But you can hardly help uh, but think of Romans chapter 13 when you read this. Uh, you, you, God uh, has ordained principalities and powers in governments and so forth. And as it states there, as long as you obey the law, in this nation particularly, you've got freedom of religion. It gives us the right to legally to transmit to the world the Word of God with our freedom of speech, freedom of religion. That is to say, as long as we obey the law. Now, you may have some people that would come along and say, hey, don't pay your taxes. That's disobeying the law. And guess what happens to you when you don't pay your taxes? You go to jail. Okay. You do time. And basic, most often, that's just the way it operates. So a fool you can listen to, but then you become a bigger fool than they do. Always obey. In the first place, Daniel was a tax collector. God expects us to carry our part of the load and from that to receive the blessings whereby you are granted license, broadcasting permits to legally take God's word around the world. 
So therefore, it's very important that you pay attention. You don't want to uh, obey an illegal order, but as long as it's legal, that's fantastic. You go for it. Picking a good work that you can do within that community, nation, that um, you're happy with. Therefore, you can be happy. Verse 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, that is to say, to um, a, a misfit, quarrelsome, griping about everything that turns a hitch, but gentle, that means conciliatory, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, many people get carried away with this. If, if you um, be no brawl, brawler and you happen to be over a particular group of people, then don't get such milk toast or conciliatory that you put up with nonsense. That doesn't happen. Therefore, if you are placed in a point by God of leadership, you practice a little tough love and you throw the boiler out, brawler out. You don't tolerate it. You cannot, you cannot operate and function into the beautiful spirit of God where all things are pure to those that are pure and have a bunch of misfits around. It won't fly. So you have to hold that line and, and people must toe that mark. That's called tough love. It's called discipline. Everyone can discipline themselves. If you, if you have personal problems, you take care of your personal problems and try as best you can not to bring it into the group. Oh, but always, as, at all possibility, be conciliatory. That, that is what this gentleness is. Uh, and that will gain a lot of ground for our Heavenly Father. For this is the way Christ was. He was gentle and he was conciliatory, but when he had to clean his father's house, he got him a cat of nine tails and he laid it to the back of the money changers and turned those mite infested doves through the cages open and let them go. Um, he cleaned house. When you have to do that, you have to do it. That uh, goes with it. That also is a very peaceful thing to accomplish because it brings peace to the body of Christ. Verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And Paul, Paul was familiar with this. Paul was very zealous. And being zealous, uh, he would get on some toes at times. But at the same time, when he was misled, and when he did not accept Christ in the beginning, as you read in Acts chapter 7, he helped the coats while his little cronies stoned Stephen to death. I mean, a very loyal, you'll never get a better Bible lesson than Stephen taught in his last minutes before Paul and his group uh, killed him. So Paul, Paul never really forgave himself for that. I know he did, but he had trouble with it. He felt like he was the biggest sinner of all the apostles, and he did have trouble with it. Why? Well, as he had his conversion on the road to Damascus, it wasn't a thing of choice. God knocked him down, struck him, and let him know, I chose, you're a chosen vessel, meaning God chose him in the first earth age. Why? He knew he was zealous. He knew when he saw the truth that he would not bend and would not give, and Paul would not. That's why through any beating or anything else, God had touched him, and he held that line. He knew the word was real, and our father was real. There, there, um, the, the point being, when you're mixed up in the world, there are times that you do things wrong. Why? You don't know any better. But once you come to knowledge, once the Holy Spirit touches you and brings you out of it, you do know better. And 
when God gives a truth to you, to whom God gives much, he expects much. He expects you to take that and let it grow, take root in your very system and, and flourish, whereby it produces fruit that is enjoyable by everyone. That is to say, a child of the living God. So it is um, when, when, when you uh, come into the truth, it changes you and um, washes you. It's a precious thing. Verse 4. But after that the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. And, and, and that kindness is his love. And um, it appeared in the Savior. He paid that price, as we learned back in that 14th verse of chapter 2. Don't ever forget it. He paid the price to redeem us. That is to say, to forgive all iniquity. That is to say, those that are foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hateful, and hating one another, causing trouble with one another. He redeemed you from that. Because when you realize what he did for us, that he is opening the gate to both a better world here, but most important to a world coming that is an eternity of a wonderful, amazing time that you spend with Almighty God and the rest of the children in peace and harmony in the third earth age, which is called the heaven earth age. But it was the kindness of God that in love he would send this one, this one that would show us the way, and not only show us the way, but redeem us. You see, that's what Savior means, is that once you repent and go to him, he saves you. He saves you from the hate and, the, and disobedience and so forth, Why? because he loves you. He shows you a better way, and he is that way. Christ is that way. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That's not what saves you. But according to his mercy, he saved us. And that mercy is, is his charis. That is his unmerited favor, his love. He did it willingly. And um, through that mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. How precious it is that that greatest gift, the Holy Spirit, you have with you today. That's why you're never alone. That's why you can say without any doubt whatsoever, he will never leave me, he will never forsake me, because he is always with me. Washing of regeneration. It, regeneration is like making you a new creature. But this word washing is an interesting word in the Greek tongue. It is lutron, lutron. And it means to baptize. It, it doesn't mean to just wet your hands. It doesn't mean to sprinkle. Lutron means washed all over all over your soul, your being, washed white as snow because you're redeemed and lutron, making you um, a child of God and regenerated back into the pureness. To the pure, all things are pure. And that washing is the anchor of that purity when that Holy Spirit touches you and brings you to that point of regeneration in knowing and always understanding those whom our Father gives much, He expects much. And in understanding the clarity and to be a follower of His and to stand against the fiery darts of Satan, especially in this generation. Verse 6 to continue which he shed, he poured out 
on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He richly poured out that salvation. He did not hold back from you. When, when you open your heart to Him, when you confess to Him, when you repent to Him, through that He redeems you. And He does it with love. Why? Because that's the reason He created your very soul in the first earth age even. It's because He loved you. He wanted somebody just like you are. But He does want you to love Him. And once you love Him, and once you practice that, and let Him know, communicate with Him. Communication moves away a, a ton of, of uh, doubt and unknown. Communicate with Him. Just talk to Him. Let Him know. He's very intelligent. Let him know that you love him and let him abundantly pour out upon you his love. And with his love comes understanding. Understanding what? Understanding his word that gives you life. And I'm not talking about life in the flesh also, only, but life eternal with him. That's what he wants. That's what he strives for. Verse 7 that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's that eternal life, not just this life, but life forever with Him. This, this word justified means cleared of all guilt. Don't you ever, ever, when, once you repent, and once He regains you, once you are pure, all things are pure, don't you ever let anyone put you on a guilt trip of some sin you might have committed back uh, as um, verse um, uh, 3 might have uh, explained. Don't let somebody throw that back up in your face. You're free. And that freedom, when you are set free, the Word does it. He does it. You're free indeed. And do you understand what it is that does set you free? It's truth. St. John chapter 8, verse 32. Learn the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's why we study the Word of God, because it frees us from hang-ups that man likes to hang on you. God will take, rip them off. He'll take them away. You're his child. He loves you, and he will not tolerate someone abusing his children. Um, and, you know, whom he gives much, he expects much. And naturally, those that um, he puts in leadership, he expects them to take care of what uh, they can take care of. You don't ask God to do something you can do yourself. If you have a brawler or somebody that's disobedient or something, you take care of business. You do not let them bring guilt back on the membership when they have truly repented. It is true that only God can judge that. God knows the mind of a person. He knows when they've truly repented. We don't. We know when they say they have, and when they live it, then you can take that as uh, His grace. That's God's grace, His unmerited favor, His love, His charisma, and let that charisma build and, and boldly come forward, whereby we all participate in eternal life. That's what we work forward to. Verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will thou affirm constantly. You, you be emphatic. You, you, you be emphatic within it. And you emphasize it. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works... That's that word, W-O-R-K-S, works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Um, Paul, Paul, what did Paul do? He was a tent maker. He loved making tents. He chose to be a tent maker, and that's why he would join Prisca and her husband, Aquila. They, they were tent makers. That was his profession, and... I, 
I can assure you with his zealousness, he made better tents than anybody else. You can rest assured Paul would not settle for anything halfway. So always pick a work that you enjoy, that you feel led to, God led to. And you know something? Even in work, though you, you should not practice teaching at work unless, unless you happen to be in that field, but on, on your daily job where you sustain yourself and your family, the very way you live, your happiness, your joy, uh, that grows on others and they see it and they're drawn to it because you're happy working with what you work at. It's always best. I know sometimes when jobs are few and far between, but always work up to something you enjoy doing. It makes life such a pleasure when you're doing something you enjoy rather than dreading and dreading and dreading what you're doing. That's, that's a, all, you're, you're setting yourself up to be miserable rather than happy. Always take care of business and uh, provide for yourself. But what he's saying, uh, th these are faithful sayings. You want to affirm it, teach it earnestly, and emphasize it, that good works are important. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and vain. Uh, you know, there is a strange thing about this word law here. It's uh, namkos uh, and namakos. And eight other times it's translated as a lawyer. And what it's saying here is um, don't, don't get all tangled up in foolish genealogies while well, he's the I'm so-and-so the third, and I'm so-and-so the fourth, don't you know? Okay. Uh, don't you understand that I'm a blue blood? Okay. You know, that, that just doesn't cut it. Now, many people then might say, well, what does it mean? I thought it was important to know the genealogies of Christ. Well, it is. But that's not foolish. Christ's genealogy as it is given in Luke chapter 3 is not a foolish genealogy. It's extremely important. It lets you gives you the key of David. It lets you unlock doors nobody can close and close doors that nobody can open. No, why? Because it lets you know who the true offspring of David, through whereby recognizing Kenites and knowing who the Antichrist returns to, who his children are, and so on and so forth. Genealogies are extremely important in God's Word, but not foolish genealogies. That's, uh, that doesn't cut it. And, and don't um, have strivings about the lawyers. Don't let the lawyers strive. Well, I'm going to find, I, my, I'm having a disagreement with this Christian brother. I'm going to get me a lawyer. Or let's say that two people are splitting up. Well, we could, we are not going to go find a, a denominator. We're not going to find a counselor Christian that could tell us what is right here, an arbitrator. I'm getting me a lawyer. That's what it's talking about. And the other part is, well, if you're getting a lawyer, I'm getting a lawyer. Guess when all things are said, well, here comes the judge. Well, now the court's got to have costs too. Lawyer cost, lawyer cost here, court cost here. Guess who ends up with everything both of them have? Okay. I'm making friends and influencing people here in, in the judicial system. All right. But they could have had a good Christian arbitrator that could have helped them settle it, and they would have all their monies. Well, uh-uh, no, no, we are getting me a lawyer. That's, that's money wasted. If you do have a good Christian arbitrator, that's what God is saying here. No strivings like that. Don't get into court. Don't get involved if it can be worked out among Christians. And um, for they are unprofitable and vain. Why? You'll end up with nothing. They'll take it all from you. They're good at it. 
You know, it, I, I'll go ahead and go one step further. In, in this generation, when you turn on your boob tube, every other commercial is some ambulance chaser. It's some lawyer wanting to sue somebody that created a medicine, a drug, or something trying to sue the medical profession whereby that, that um, insurance for malpractice is so high, that's why it costs so much to go to a doctor is because of the nomicos, that's to say the lawyers. And just making them happy here, but this is the truth. If you don't believe it, turn your television on and see how many scrubbers there are out there ready to get into the pocket of big business uh, and other people. I realize there are bad things that happen to people, and rightfully so, usually it's taken care of. But every other commercial, and you wonder then why, why insurance for health is so high, among many other reasons lately, be that as it may. Verse 10, to continue. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admission, reject. This is to say a person who is divisive in the group that brings in his own thoughts or original thoughts he thinks of certain things, but it's not God's plan. What you do is you give him one warning and you give him two warnings, but God said when it comes to the third warning, he's out. Reject him. Get rid of him. He's trouble. All he, all he will ever do is destroy your work or, or uh, attempt to. That's God's way of doing things. And, and there would be some bleeding heart Christian would say, well, now that doesn't sound very gentle. It's love. You don't understand love if you don't understand true love that you would let some nitwit, I'm not calling anybody names, but that's what they are, come in and try to destroy a good work of God with his own far out thoughts, okay? You don't put up with it because you love the family enough you protect them from such a one. Verse 11, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. His own mouth condemns him. God doesn't have to. You've known people like that. They're not that difficult to spot. Three times, you're out. Verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Thycacus, he be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I am determined there to winter. We'll, we'll have some good old times and talking and, and studying the word and everything. We'll, we'll just winter there. Verse 13, bring Zenus the lawyer. Let's, let's have him along with us, you know, straighten his case out. And Apollos, on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. You, you, they've been helpful to us. You see that they want nothing as they make the trip with you. You take care of business, and God will take care of his own. Uh, Paul was quite a leader very understanding, and, um, and, and he loved good company to study God's word with, and he chooses thusly. 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. This, this is something that is really important. You, you must find something you enjoy doing that is useful whereby you prosper. Then God can bless you. You know, some people, they, they don't even try and then wonder why God doesn't bless them. God doesn't want to bless somebody that won't try. But um, that's why he says, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses. You can always find a way of where there's something where you can be a useful person. Always remember that. And when you're a useful person, 
to, then you are fruitful. You're not unfruitful. An unfruitful person, you want to remember what God said he would do. Christ is the vine, we're the branches, and God's the pruner. Pruner, He'll crop off the unfruitful ones and let them fall to the ground. You don't want that. Be useful. Verse 15, to complete this great book of Titus. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace, that's charis, be with you all. Amen. And amen meaning that's the way it is, that's that. And so it is. This was written to Titus in the conclusion, ordained um, the first bishop of the church of the of Cretans from Nicopolis of Macedonia. Paul wrote it. He sent. Titus was sent to a little old island 140 miles long, 30 miles wide. But as we learned in chapter 1, some of their prophets were just bad people. It needed the word real bad, the real truth of God's word, the comfort of bringing that word. This is why he could say emphatically teach these things, emphasize the good that, brings, that this brings into the lives. So always remember, and don't let anyone take this away from you from Titus. To those who are pure, all things are pure. You work at it. And to love the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from not a few sins, all sins. And also to be a useful servant of the living God, to get your act together serve him, love him, and be blessed of all people. That's Christians, Christ mans. God loves you. Let him know you love him in return. Book of Titus, hope you enjoyed it. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. So if you ask us to judge a certain ch church or men mention a church or their way, we won't touch it, okay? That's God's business. You have the right to spiritually discern when you hear the truth. And that discernment gives you a real good life. Always thank our Father for that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now you've got a prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You're his child. And he loves you. He wants to protect you lift you, bless you when you deserve it coming from him and what he demands most is your love. Don't withhold it from him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Robin from Texas. Um, how big is the gulf in heaven? Also, what do you think of the planet alignment that will be taking place at the end of 2012. I do not believe it's the end of the world, as many do. 
because not even Jesus knows when that will be. So how can man? Am I right? You are right. But there, let, let me correct you on one thing, though. First, the gulf is, simply means it's, it's a place that is a boundary that no one can cross. And it doesn't have to be that wide. It's God's order. Don't cross it. Okay. But there is no planet alignment, alignment when the winter solstice comes into being. But the solstice point, the ecliptic of it, crosses the galactic equator, This, which the galactic equator is the Milky Way to most of you. It aligns directly with the center of that at that moment on that spot. It only happens every 25,800 years. I'll, I'll repeat that again. No planet alignment, but simply that the point of the solstice, the ecliptic, hits the middle, very middle of the Milky Way. The, and, um, and on that date, 2012, December the 21st. And um, uh, it only happens every 25,800 years. It's kind of an unusual thing. What does it mean? Well, we're going to find out before long, huh? <clears throat> it means exactly that. The ecliptic hits the Milky Way. Okay, uh, we got um, L.A. from South Carolina. Um, I, I, okay, thank you. for. I get more understanding from the word of God the way you teach. I thank God for you. Well, thank you. The word's good. My question is, is there a difference between a backslider and a man who never accepted Christ in his life? Me and a family member have different opinions about this. I'll be watching for your answer. God bless and thank you for the staff. You're welcome. <clears throat> Naturally, a backslider must do one thing. That's repent. He's our, salvation is already there for him, as Hebrews chapter 6 so stipulates. He can't be saved again. Because if he did, he's saying Christ failed. Christ doesn't fail. The salvation is there, but if you pull away from it, you must repent to get back to it. Otherwise, you could go to hell. Okay. Now, a first-timer, intuitively, when he or she makes their mind up they want to follow him, then it's also good to repent for all sins and ask his forgiveness and let him know you love him. But there is a difference in Hebrews 6. We'll kind of uh, let that uh, go, let that by for you. It's put, when I was a child, I spake as a child, but perfection means maturity in that. You've got to be mature. Uh, L.A. from South Carolina, same person. I enjoy your program. I watch every, thank you. Do everyone in Christ have the spirit of discernment? Uh, to different degrees. It's according to your spirit of discernment is strengthened by how close you are to the Father. By that I mean how, how well you study His Word, that you communicate with Him. Uh, <clears throat> some might say, you mean studying the Word gives you better discernment? Well, it educates you. If you didn't study the Word, you would not even know there were Kenites around that you should have spiritual discernment when one of their spirits come near or your spirit can feel it. You've got to be educated in that or you're minus spiritual discernment. <clears throat> it's okay. We're going to go with, uh, this would be Frederick from uh, Florida and Semper Fi. Right back to you. Good. Pastor Murray, you said there is something in the Bible that could help with dementia of, or memory. Could you please give chapter and verse? I either missed it or forgot it. I think probably what you heard me say is simply studying God's Word will help you with that. But once, once you are ill, God recognizes that. And it certainly never ask him for he uh, hurts to ask for healing, and um, but naturally, 
the, the more, the harder you try and exercise the mind, the better off you are, and also to be healthy as best you can. Annie from California, um, you are the best teacher ever. Well, thank you. Keep, keep God's word is so good. It is. Keep on going. In. I'm from Ireland, and I know a lot about its history. How come there is no snakes in Ireland? or any wild animals. We'll be home in Ireland soon telling all the people I know about your great teaching. Please go on DISH in Ireland. Um, you're, you're, um, and so forth. Oh, the, you do get the computer there, and that's fine. The reason there are no snakes or wild animals in Ireland is the snakes were the Kenites, and St. Paddy drove them out. He wouldn't tolerate it. So that's what he did. He did not drive out serpents. He drove out serpent people, as to say, Kenites. And Ireland should be very proud, and they should keep it thusly. Kim from Oklahoma. Pastor Murray, someone told me you can't cook with vinegar because they gave it to Jesus when he was thirsty. And one more thing, what does God, does God think about men hitting women? What advice can you give me? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you one thing. God doesn't like it. But I'll tell you something else. Women don't like it either. And um, it's not a fun thing. I, I know in Texas many years ago, there was a mama that her boys went out, and man, I mean, they got plastered, and they told her they were going to do this and do that. They come home, she took a wagon sheet and put it under their mattress, and when they were all got home and passed out drunk, she pulled that wagon sheet over them and sewed it up. And then she got her whip, and those were four big old grown boys. And she gave them a lesson what for. Don't mess with women if you're smart men. They, they can get you sooner or later, all right? So it's not nice to hit women. Okay. It hurts, and it's ridiculous. A man that will not look out and take care of his own family, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, is worse than an infidel. He is an infidel. <clears throat> okay, and on, on vinegar. This is, you know, this is how many people that supposedly teach God's Word that are not familiar with the manuscripts have a great deal of trouble. This so-called vinegar that they put to Christ's lips was Roman's poor man's wine. Okay. It was kind of called vinegar, but it was a poor Roman soldier's wine. And they usually would offer that to kill pain to people that were crucified, if they had any compassion at all. And this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to pass a drug off, which this wine was to a degree, where Christ would, it would ease his pain. He didn't need it, okay. Uh, he was able. But, so, you, um, if you couldn't cook with vinegar, man, what about good old-fashioned wilted lettuce? Woo! You know, you wouldn't even be able to have that. That'd be a shame, okay. And, and uh, what in the world would I put in my friolis? If I couldn't put pepper sauce or vinegar in my beans, okay. um, you can cook with vinegar. It's not a poor man's wine. Okay, Sarah from Texas, we enjoy your CD. Thank you. I would like to know if I am wrong. I have a girl. She is 38 and lives with a man on drugs and will not work. They be together for three years. I told her he is not welcome in my house, and she said, I am wrong. She loves him. I would like to know if I am right or wrong. Sarah, you're the head of that. your castle. If you don't want a druggie in there, don't allow it. I wouldn't. I, I don't want a druggie in my house, and uh, especially if it's somebody abusing my daughter that way. Uh, no, you're not doing wrong. You're doing right. And, and so it is. Uh, uh, Lois from Nebraska. 
When Christ said uh, there would be not one stone standing upon another, was he referring only to Jerusalem uh, or places like Rome also? No, it was just Jerusalem. He, these specific buildings is what he was talking about. Why? It's Mount Zion. It's the place that God had made, has made a contract with, his most favorite spot in the world, Ezekiel chapter 16. He made an eternal, everlasting contract with that geographical location, not Rome. And it will be cleansed. And he will be back there. That's where his eternal kingdom will be established at. Deborah from Georgia, where in the Bible does it say that children on our babies will be all the same age in heaven? Well, um, when you're in a spiritual body, how old are you? And as much as all spiritual bodies were created by God in the first earth age, and there are no babies in spiritual bodies because all bodies were created, not born. Okay. Only in flesh bodies are there babies. To fulfill God's will that each person, each soul from there is placed in their spiritual body in a babe in the mother's womb to innocent to make his or her mind up whether they'll love God or Satan. So how every time that a child or a young person, an angel I'll say, has been witnessed, they're always a young person. They appear to be a young person. Why? They're not young. They're all the way from the first earth age. It's just they look young because in a spiritual body, eternal life is certain and there's no such thing as age. In other words, the spirit body is a different dimension that age has no effect whatsoever on. So I, I hope that helps you. Uh, Pamela from Georgia. Why is it that some women cannot have children when we are to go forth to multiply? Well, there's um, we, we live in a polluted world and who knows what all happens, but... Uh, um, it's um, and God has different purposes for all people so who knows we just let let her father take care of that part Joyce from Illinois um, I I can I get a great deal of pleasure and wisdom from you and enjoy your actions as you speak looks like one of you with your that you are one with your watchers. I can see you love Father God. I do too. Could you tell me what the letters are above Jesus' head on the cross? It's four letters, what it stands for, I-N-R-I. I-N-R-I in that language is Jesus of Nazareth, King of Israel. R is Re N is Nazareth, R is Rex, which is um, king, and I again is Rael. Uh, David from North Carolina. I don't remember exactly where, but the bright and morning star speaks of Jesus Christ. And in the King James Version, but I'm in other version, it speaks of Satan as the bright and morning star. What are your thoughts? Well, Satan copies everything. Do you know what the word Lucifer in Isaiah 14 means? It means bright morning star. And that's what Satan is going to copy. That's why instead of Christ, he's called Antichrist. Instead of Christ. He copies everything he can. To why He, he wanted the mercy seat in the office that goes with it. And he's very serious about it. And you, he can afford to be because most of the world whores after him. They're deceived, they don't care. That encourages him to think that he's got it made. Uh, Sophia from Michigan, please explain to me 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. I am 14 years old and I enjoy looking my best. My family and I love your teachings and we have learned so much about God's word. Thank you so much. Well, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, 
And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 has to do with plaiting the hair and putting on lots of makeup. There's nothing wrong with looking your best, my dear, and you should. And there's nothing wrong with using makeup in moderation. But you see, um, when during biblical times, certain colors meant certain occupations. And that's why people, you wanted to be, want all things in moderation. That's the way God is. It's called common sense. And uh, it's so good to hear from you. And I'm glad you, I'm proud of you that you like to look nice. That's great. You're, you're a proud Christian woman growing right into it. You hang tough. We love you. Charlene from New Jersey. Question, would you explain who are the riders on the red horses and the black horse and the pale horse in Revelation 6, the seals? And naturally, as you know, the first one is Antichrist. They play out usually with war brings famine and famine brings death. And those are the riders uh, of the horses that follow. The four horsemen that will take you right out of it. The Antichrist bringing the deception and war and then famine and then death. Okay, uh, from Tennessee we have um, Kathleen. Does God intervene in the lives of his free wills, willers if they ask, pray, and live right? Uh, he will if they ask, yeah, but they have to ask him and, and there's, this is just common sense. He will not interfere in someone that has free will. This is opposed on the other end of the spectrum to one of God's elect. He will interfere in their life. He states in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, along in there, you don't even know what to pray for, but I, I can move you around because you were justified basically in the first earth age. But he will not interfere with someone with free will because on Judgment Day, if he were to interfere without their asking, they might have a complaint against God that he caused them to do this, okay? So he won't unless they ask. That's simply because of judgment. Uh, what jobs do free willers have in the millennium? Well, if, if they overcome, they will teach along with God's election. Uh, bad in Louisiana, I was watching your TV program a few days ago when you read a letter from a person who said they had Googled you on the internet and it said that you were bad. Then I also Googled you on the internet and sure enough, it said that you were bad. Then I Googled my name and uh-oh, it said that I was bad too. According to the internet, I need to get on your prayer list. Bad in Louisiana. Well, you're there, but don't, don't worry about what the internet says, okay? You know, everything that Shepherd's Chapel, every teaching that we do is televised to the world. We have no secrets. We don't hide anything. And it's quite popular. So, uh, unfortunately, when you're successful, Sometimes people that are small like to judge people. And if they can't find anything, which they never will from our teaching, all we do is teach God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Then they make stuff up. So it, it doesn't matter what people say about you on the Internet. It's what God says about you. That's what's important because He's the one from whom all blessings flow. People that listen to junk on the internet are just a bunch of junkies. They are so confused that they absolutely don't know truth from fiction. Look at real life. Test the fruit. Look at them. Don't go by what some crackpot has to say about them. Test the fruit. If the fruit is sweet, it's sweet. If it's sour, it's sour, period. End of story. Uh, Tom from Pennsylvania, can you explain to me what the verse means by those who crucified Christ and it all over again to themselves? How is that done? Also, can I be forgiven because I have fallen back into some of the same things and it grieves my heart so that I repented 
never to repeat. Well, why, you know, when, when you have a habit that you can't seem to break and you keep falling back, rather than promising God you're not going to do it anymore if he'll forgive you, ask his help to outgrow it, okay? That's, that's the way you do it. Um, and I'm not sure what verse means by those who crucified Christ all over again to themselves. Oh, I know what you're thinking about. It's Hebrews chapter 6. What, what it is is Christ does the saving. He died once on the cross to make that possible that he could, on repentance, forgive you all sins. And if you say you've got to be saved again rather than repenting, you're, you're saying he, he, Christ failed, so he needs to be crucified again. Don't ever say Christ failed in his salvation it's man that backslides and goes to hell. The salvation was there and they had it made and they threw it away. Jason from Virginia, what is the unforgivable sin? I haven't had that question in quite some time. It's one I receive quite often to boot. It's um, Luke chapter 12, verse 10, one of God's elect that will not allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them against the false Christ when he appears on earth. And I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day. And when you make God's day, boy, is He going to make yours. It, it, he, he will happy you when you let Him know you love Him. Be honest. Don't try to con Him. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important though, you listen to me and you listen good now. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.